Hello. Okay. Uh, thank you all for attending this week's colloquium. I am. It's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, mentor, and friend, uh, Professor Ryan Thigpen of the University of Kentucky. Um, so Ryan is associate professor of geology there, and he works on topics related to structural re geology, computational geo mechanics and basin and mountain belt geodynamics. Um, Ryan's the lead on a large multidisciplinary project on the history and evolution of the Tetons in Wyoming, which he'll be presenting on today. Um, he's also worked in the Scottish Glidonides, um, as well as um, in computational geomechanics as a structural geologist and geomechanics project lead for BP America and continues to contribute to this field with a special interest in salt tectonics. Um, Dr. Thigpen is also interested in coupling tectonics and surface processes and has applied this to his work on large scale collisional systems like the Appalachians and the Himalaya. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Thigpen um, and his exciting talk today. Thank you. I don't guess I need this. <laughs> All right, thanks Steph for the introduction and uh, thanks to Stephanie and uh, Kip for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm, I haven't been here before, I realize. I, I've been here before, but I've never seen all of this, this nice setup. So this is really spectacular, and you guys have a really great thing going. Um, arguably the largest seminar screen in history, maybe. So I hope I don't get a sunburn standing in front of it. So today I'm going to talk to you. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to convince you of some really absurd things using some really basic geologic principles. This is a project um, that started some years ago, I'll give you a little bit of the history of it, um, but it has evolved into this giant snowball of a thing um, that is now involving five or six PIs, um, depending on the day. Uh, numerous grad students, numerous undergraduate students um, dealing with park service and permitting and all sorts of wild things that I never thought um, would occupy so much of my time, but it's been a lot of fun. And the fun part for me about this project is that a lot of the ideas in it are really simple um, but the interpretations or the hypotheses coming out of it um, are incredibly controversial. And so they rankle a lot of people and that can be a lot of fun too. Um, I do wanna thank um, the GSA um, and the Wyoming Research Station funded a lot of the early parts of this work. Um, fortunately, NSF um, funded the last big proposal that we put in um, to really take this work to the next level. And we couldn't have done any of this stuff in Grand Teton National Park in Yellowstone um, without the, the help and sort of commitments and assistance of the Park Service. So for um, anybody that's not been there, doesn't know, um, we're, I'm going to be talking today about the Teton Fault. And the Teton Fault is this range-bounding normal fault. Um, you can see it here on this little block diagram. And so the Teton Range proper that you see in the National Park is the uplifted foot wall of this big normal fault. Um, Jackson Hole, the famous Jackson Hole Valley, where Jackson Hole Ski Resort is and where you can buy um, a really nice piece of property for $2 million an acre, um, is that drop down uh, hanging wall in the, in the valley. It's um, an interesting confluence of geologic provinces here. You have the Teton Fault, which before we started working there, in some ways, um, we didn't really know the age or genesis of it. We didn't really know um, what it was related to. Um, we've got these big basement thrusts that uplift, um, big basement uplifts like the Cache Creek Fault. Um, this, this sort of system of structures also uplifts the other big mountain range in Wyoming, the Wind River Range. Um, we've got the severe fold and thrust belt, which is the you know, sort of um, 130 to 80 million year old thrust belt that goes through what seems like most of Western North America. We have these basin arranged normal faults like the Grand Valley Fault, um, the Teton Fault, as we'll find out. Um, that are extending all of this thrusted terrain. And then we've got the Yellowstone hotspot track, um, including the modern calderas like Huckleberry Ridge, uh, Mesa Falls, and Yellowstone that sort of also intersect this terrain. So from a geologic perspective, this is an incredibly complex place to work where a lot of things are coming together. Um, it's a really neat place to work for, uh, for some societal reasons as well. The Teton Fault is still an active, a very, very active fault. Um, it's produced um, two, what we found in, in SCARPS or what other trenching studies have found in SCARPS, uh, two major slip events in the last 12,000 years that total about four meters of slip. So these are sort of magnitude seven earthquakes. Um, but interestingly enough, the 
recent moraines that sort of 12 to 15,000 year old glacial moraines, which are shown spectacularly in this Park Service LIDAR, are offset by the scarp much more than four meters. So there's this really large seismic, what we'll call a seismic gap. It's basically eight, nine meters of slip um, that remain unaccounted for that we know have happened in the last 15,000 years, but, but for events which we haven't necessarily found. And that causes a big problem for doing things like predicting recurrence interval. I'll talk about this a little bit at the end. It's not gonna be the focus of my talk, but um, this is one of the most spectacularly exposed active normal faults um, that you'll see anywhere and, and really incredible when they cut these glacial moraines in the LIDAR data. So what's really interesting to me and what I'm gonna focus on today is this um, sort of topographic setup that we have here. So um, this area that you see down here in the bottom, this is that basin range um, extensional terrain. We get a bunch of these basin range extensional faults up here to the north, but in between the, the two of these, we've got this incredibly flat, denuded Snake River Plain that marks the track of the Yellowstone hotspot. So as the North American plate moves over the hotspot, you can see sort of sequentially these caldera forming events that, that form along this track. And so when, when I look at this picture, I have to say to myself, there's really two possibilities here. Either for whatever, for some amazing reason, the Snake River Plain has always been this really flat place um, and arguably the only flat denuded place in a mountain belt that otherwise extends from basically central Mexico to northern Canada, right? That's hypothesis number one. Hypothesis number two is that there's something about the migration of the Snake River, um, uh, the migration of the hotspot along the Snake River Plain that is causing the erasure or the removal of these mountain belts like a giant pencil eraser. And so this is something I've, I've thought about and a lot of people have thought about for a really long time. Um, and the Teton Range shown right here is the most recent active normal fault to intersect the most modern part of this track. So this brown is the um, Huckleberry Ridge eruption. This is one of the largest super caldera eruptions in history. It was, I don't remember what, you know, 2000 times the volume of Mount St. Helens, something crazy. Um, but then the more recent uh, Yellowstone eruption shown here in white, that's the 600,000 year old eruption. But today I'm gonna to talk to you about some evidence that I feel like we've been gathering that suggests that the Teton range used to extend well into this hotspot, was quite a bit older than, than where the hotspot sits today, and was actually removed by um, the, the explosion of this hotspot. So um, doing a project like this is actually, um, it, it, it's been, like I said, it went from a one person show or two person show to a large multidisciplinary project um, there's multiple colleagues I'm working with, Mike McGlue, Ed Woolery, Kevin Yeager, working on various components of this. Um, Summer Brown, um, my wife, was actually started this project as a master's student in 2008. Um, I actually, she's kind of the, um, the godmother of this project. I followed her out and was simply her rock fetcher. So I brought a climbing rope and a partner and we uh, just went where she told us. And then she uh, gave me the science part of it and said, you go deal with this, I'm gonna take photos. Um, Stephanie Sparks, Patrick Whalen, Rachel Hoare, um, Meredith Swalm, Sarah Johnson, Autumn Helfrich, and Ryan Goldsby are all grad students that have worked on this project, and there's actually a couple more now. Um, my dad cooks for us. Willie um, harvests the helium out of our appetite grains, and down in the corner is my research group last year. Almost every single one of those undergrads and grad students has played some role in this project. So it's been this, in addition to being a fun and cool science project, it's been an incredible learning opportunity for a whole lot. Um, of, of young, outstanding scientists. So these are the things I'm gonna to try to convince you of, and I promise I'm gonna to try to do it in less than 45 minutes, and I promise I'm gonna to try to keep it exciting. Um, the first thing is that I'm gonna to try to convince you of is that the Teton Range is actually much older than the position of the modern Yellowstone hotspot. So the modern Yellowstone hotspot arrived into that position about 2 million years ago, we think that based on the work we've been doing that the Teton range started moving about 25 to 23 million years ago and really got going about 10 to 8 million years ago um, growing so that it was well established by the time Yellowstone arrived. Um, I'm going to try to convince you that the max displacement on the Teton faults a lot longer than people have thought about 11 to 14 kilometers instead of traditional interpretations that say it's as little as two. Um, I'm going to, in doing that, I'm going to try to convince you that the Paleo Teton fault was a lot longer, that it extended into Yellowstone um, a great deal and, and potentially all the way across. 
I'm also going to try to convince you very speculatively that it probably the range front that's missing now probably collapsed into the Huckleberry Ridge caldera. And then I'm going to show you some of our most recent work that we think demonstrates that this extensional zone occupied by the Teton Fault and this uh, Gallatin Fault in the north is actually trying to persist. It's trying to reestablish itself after the eruption of these calderas. So just a little bit of quick terminology you're going to hear me talking about. So when we extend the crust and we get a big normal fault, two things happen. Um, one, the hanging wall will drop down. But on the other side, the foot wall actually is going to lift up. This is going to happen due to isostasy. And so you're going to hear me saying total displacement. When I talk about that, I'm talking about the foot wall uplift plus the hanging wall drop. When I talk about the foot wall uplift, I'm just talking about this side of the fault, hanging wall drop just this side. Um, and then, of course, the foot wall as it rises up gets eroded, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit as well. But to start this off, what we did in 2008 when we came here, we didn't actually have a good age on the uplift of the Teton Range. Nobody knew exactly when the thing started moving. And so Summer's project was to come here, a master's project at Virginia Tech, was to come out here and use um, low temperature thermochronology, specifically apatite, uranium, thorium, helium, an appetite fission track to date the uplift of this range. I'm going to show you, hopefully, very simply how I do how we did this. Um, but the basic idea for both of these systems is that they're temperature controlled. For the helium system, we have helium being produced by uranium and thorium samarium constantly in these appetite grains. When the grains are hot, say you know 70 degrees C or something, that helium gets diffused out of the grain. As the grain moves closer to the surface, it cools, and when it cools, it starts trapping that helium and it essentially starts that clock ticking. For fission track, um, it's a similar process, but it's actually making damage tracks that at high temperatures get annealed or get sort of repaired. At lower temperatures, they start being recorded. And once again, it starts that clock. It's somewhere between 120 to 60 degrees C. So these are things that are little clocks that are really recording this upper few kilometers of motion in the crust. So if we want to get at the uplift, um, you could imagine that if we've got some grains, these, we've got these three uh, little appetite grains over here on this, that are moving towards the surface. Um, when the grain is below this, this red zone, sort of this closure temperature, it's not collecting any helium. It's not keeping any helium. Clock's not ticking. When it goes through that zone and cools, that clock starts ticking. And when it gets to the surface, we can pick it up and we can put a date on it. And the date's going to tell us about the time that it came through that window on its way up. If we collect a whole bunch of these guys um, from the top of a summit, say in the Tetons, and the foot wall of a big fault down to the bottom, and add up all of their ages, put all their ages together in a model, we know they're all moving together. We can figure out the timing of when this foot wall comes up out of the ground, starts being eroded, and starts cooling. Um, in an ideal world, what we'll actually see if we were to plot these ages from the summit up here, we should expect to have the oldest age because it came through first. And these ages get progressively younger as we go down to the youngest age at the bottom because it was the last grain to come through. And in an ideal world, we'll actually see an inflection point between these two grains um, that shows where the fault actually started moving. <clears throat> so um, this is a picture from one of those transects. This is the Grand Transect. This is a route called the Upper Exum Ridge. You can see my uh, my partner up there, and this is my always my warning about um, work in the Tetons is the Tetons are a funny place because you can almost always see your car from wherever you are on the route, which is this really crazy thing. But it's a completely different world. Um, and so my partner and I were, were simul climbing this uh, route to get to the summit to pick up one sample from the summit of the Grand um, that we had missed on a previous transect. This big thunderhead monster right here, we didn't actually see it. Um, until we came around the shoulder of this, this is kind of the second to last pitch before the summit. And it's actually faster to go up and over than to come down. There was lightning and rain and everything coming out of the bottom of this thing. Um, and it was bearing down right on top of us. Um, we made it to the summit and then started our descent um, before it hit, but it did hit us on the way down. And when we had this really interesting conversation about um, when we got to the summit about whether or not you could be struck by lightning if you were above cloud base. Um, I think we agreed you probably could, but we got out of there. Um, and my wife actually took this picture from the valley when we were in the middle of it. Um, the storm broke over the mountains like a wave. Um, and another climber in a group behind us was actually killed in the storm. Uh, we didn't know about it until we got to the valley. So it's a, 
it's an incredible place to work, but it's an incredibly dangerous place to work sometimes too. <clears throat> so this is uh, where we collected those, we collected transects all on the fault because we want to see, you know, not just like where the fault's moving at one place, but how it changes the long strike of the fault. So we collected one transect at Rendezvous Peak. This is Jackson Hole Ski Resort. Um, one here at Static Peak, um, one at the Grand, and then later went back and collected what we think is a better fault representative um, transect at Tiwanot. We've got one at Mount Moran, one at Eagles Rest Peak, one at Ranger Peak. This is the Tiwanot transect. And so this is, you can sort of imagine this front face here is sort of the face of this fault that we're trying to, to date. So we will run all these samples and I'm not gonna go through all these ages. I'm gonna show you a summary of these things, but they, they, they're pretty well behaved. Um, at the bottom of these transects, these are the appetite helium ages. Um, we generally get you know, these pretty young ages that we would expect. And as we move up, they generally get um, older and older. Um, some of these have some pretty good errors on them. The rocks in the Tetons are Archean rocks. They've um, literally, it seems, been to, um, to hell and back. Um, so the appetites are terrible. I showed you that picture at the beginning of those really beautiful appetite grains. I've literally never seen one of those. Um, Kip may have, but um, I've definitely never seen one that looks like that. But everybody uses that picture for their appetite talks. Um, so this, once we've done this, once we've run these samples, we've, we've collected this transect, we've done all these analyses. What we do is we stick these into a modeling package and there's a few different ones that will do this. We used a package by Kerry Gallagher called Cutie Cutie, um, which basically stacks those grains. It knows the difference in elevation between them. And it tries to find a temperature time space um, that, will, that will fit the ages that we're seeing. And you essentially say, Okay, I want you to explore this time and these temperature windows, and this program is going to try to find a space that will fit this stack of grains that's moving up through the crust all together. And so when we did this, um, we, this is the one for the Moran model. We learned a couple things. Well, the first thing we learned is that the Moran area, Mount Moran in the northern part of the range, records the greatest amount of cooling of any of these models, right? These are temperature time models, so it's not measuring uplift, it's measuring cooling. Um, from about 25 million years ago to about 20 million years ago, um, we record a cooling event here. And then we've got another rapid cooling event that occurs here. And so we're, we're sort of um, interpreting these to be the uplift of this fault block as the, as the Teton fault starts moving. Interestingly, all of our transects showed an onset of rapid cooling at about 10 MA, which is our high confidence um, uplift interval. But two of our transects clearly showed this earlier cooling event. And not coincidentally, both of those transects had the highest data density. So we think they're actually providing the best solution to this. Um, so we know, this is my first conclusion. We know that the Teton range based on this data that we see in all of these transects, and I didn't show all of them to you because I didn't want to bore you with inverse thermal history models, but we know that the Teton range uplift is quite a bit older than the age of the modern Yellowstone hotspot. So that checks the first box. Hopefully I've at least convinced you of that. So if we go back to that cooling model though, we can actually figure out the magnitude of cooling this thing has experienced. And so um, at Mount Moran, which we consider to be the maximum displacement or the maximum footwall uplift along the Teton Fault, we've got um, about 120 to 148 degrees C of cooling, um, starting at about 25 MA with about 82 to 93 degrees C of cooling um, in the last 10 million years. And of course, these things have some errors on them, but um, you know, they're, they're, they're inconsequential at this point. So if we want to convert, we've got, we, we know the cooling magnitude. If we want to convert this to, a, to an uplift magnitude, we need to know something about the geothermal gradient. In some places, that's really easy to do. We decided, because we like a challenge, that we were going to pick the hardest place in the world to do this. Um, and so this is a map of what the surface heat flow looks like in this region. So you can see you've got really high, not surprisingly, if any of you have ever been to Yellowstone, this is not a surprise at all, really high surface heat flows here in Yellowstone, about 150 um, microwatts per square meter. And it decays really rapidly though. And so this was actually a big challenge we faced in review because people have a lot of differing opinions about what the thermal condition of the crust looks like in this region. Um, and so these are our transects you can see here, at, um, Eagles Rest, Mount Moran, there's the Grand Teton, Static Peak Rendezvous, you can see them over here a little closer. Every one of these is in a different part of the surface heat flow regime. And so 
the surface heat flow is telling us about the total heat flow coming out of the earth. It's going to combine the mantle heat flow that comes into the crust. It's also going to combine the radiogenic heat flow of the crust proper. Because we can't know exactly what the radiogenic heat flow of the crust or the basal heat flow of the mantle is, we decided to use the surface heat flows, the measured surface heat flows, to constrain the possible change in temperature with depth, the geothermal gradient, and use that to calibrate our uplifts. So at Mount Moran, that calculated geothermal gradient was about 27 to 29 degrees C per kilometer. Not, not crazy hot, like a lot of people would expect being this close to Yellowstone. Um, so if we take that 29, if we want to be conservative, we'll take that 29 number. And we'll move back over here and say, OK, if we've got um, a total cooling of 82 to 93 from 10 MA to present, a total cooling of 120 to 148 from 25 to 23, we can take that and just divide those numbers by this 29, and we can come up with these um, footwall uplifts. Now, I should also say that for those of you that like thermodynamics, advection um, always has to be considered in these things. But these uplifts are pretty slow um, on, over geologic time. So we're, we're not addressing the ad, advection component directly here. We do that later. I won't talk about it today, but we have, we have thought about it. So, when we do this, though, we're looking at um, a total uplift of about four to five kilometers um, total with about three of that in the last 10 million years, right? Okay. The problem is the footwall uplift is only going to tell us part of the story. So now we have to take that footwall uplift and we have to convert it to total displacement. We can't image in, into the hanging wall of the Teton Fault. We've never been able to see it. Um, the rock compositions and all the things that are underneath there make it very difficult to do any real serious geophysical imaging of any kind. Um, we do some gravity surveys and some things like that, but it's, it's largely unknown. So we decided to actually model this. We said, okay, we're going to take all the possibilities, all the different fault geometries, um, the uh, detachment depths, the, all the things that you would use to describe a normal fault. Um, we're going to figure out the effective elastic thickness. This is a, um, for those of you that haven't heard this before, this is basically the thickness of the crust that's sort of supporting the flexure of your crust. And so um, you can think about this like a piece of paper versus like a big thick board. Um, if you try to bend both of them with the same force, one of them's going to distribute that bend over a much longer wavelength, one over a much shorter. And so this controls the geometry and magnitude of this footwall uplift during normal faulting and the hanging wall drop. And we can measure these things, these flexural wavelengths um, for these models and then take those model results, this is shown here in this red line, and compare them to the actual observed profile, which is shown, I mean, these gray and blue lines, this is the swath topography. So it's like averaging the topography across the Teton. We're fortunate because this is probably one of the few places um, that I've seen in the world that you could. You, you know, you could do this fair, fairly accurately. So my grad student, Autumn Helfrich, this was her master's thesis. She built, um, this is just one model result. She did these in, in Midland Valley's MOVE program, um, but she built like 13 different models that evaluated all these different parameters and find the one that gives us the best fit. Um, and then we carry that model forward, look at those model results and um, use it to figure out how much footwall uplift and um, is there for a given amount of displacement, um, which will allow us to determine the total displacement from, from those footwall uplift values that we calculated. And if anybody's more interested in this, I can, I'll talk more about some of these things tomorrow um, in a little greater detail. But if we, we take all those model results, so this is, um, this is 13 models or 12 models of autumns um, with the results all, all shown here. So we've got on the y-axis of all these graphs, we have the accumulated displacement. So these models are displacing um, two kilometers to uh, two to one to two kilometers at a time, some of them at different time intervals. Um, and we can see that there, there's, um, we have footwall flexural wavelength is this first box. And so this is that observed wavelength of the Teton uplift. And you can see a whole bunch of these models cross that zone. Um, these are all models that have um, actually a flexural, uh, I mean, a, a, a effective elastic thickness of about five kilometers, which is thin in a lot of places, but works really well here. Um, these other models didn't, didn't reproduce it at all that had um, higher effective elastic thicknesses. 
Um, our hanging wall basin widths were even more tighter constraint. Um, only our um, effective elastic thickness models of five kilometers that had the steep surface dip, 60 to 70 degrees of the Teton fault would match those. So that honed in pretty quickly. Um, and then once we have that match, um, which our best one was actually model 13, which is this, this pink guy shown here, um, the really bold pink line you see, we can actually figure out how much footwall uplift corresponds to different amounts of displacements in these models. And essentially what we learned um, in this process was that to get to that really um, low uplift we saw in the last 10 million years at Mount Moran, we were gonna need about eight to nine kilometers of displacement. It's about, um, about 30 to 30, 32% something. To get to the total uplift we've seen over the last 23 million years, we're gonna need um, to go quite a bit higher, maybe uh, 11 to, I don't know, as high as like 14 or something kilometers of displacement to reach that to reach that higher um, footwall uplift amount. So now we think, okay, so we've got, we've got all this displacement on this fault, 11 to 14 kilometers. Well, that's great, okay? Um, we feel very confident about these numbers. We've sort of worked through a bunch of other um, pieces of evidence. We think actually a lot of the earlier estimates actually fit into this model. They're just some um, different age units and constraints that are used, and I'm not gonna go into all that today, but you know, we've got this number, well, big deal, who cares? Like, Right? Was it nine kilometers? Is it 14 kilometers? How many of you have stayed up at night wondering this? Raise your hand. Yeah, me neither. The thing that it really bears on is what the displacement looks like in this system. So faults actually are relatively simple, and in most cases are relatively simple um, things. They, this, this is just like the crack in your windshield, right? When you first crack your windshield and there's a little bit of displacement on that crack, the crack's not very long. But as the crack, as the displacement gets longer, as, the, as it offsets more and more, that crack actually grows. And there, there's a bunch of different complexities to how faults actually grow, but all of them show pretty clear length to displacement scaling relationships so that you increase the displacement. At some point, you have to also increase the length. And so this is a, an empirical data set from um, Fawson and Densmore and Curry. Um, that shows a bunch of these faults over a range of maximum displacement scales, you know, up to kilometers of displacement, and over length scales from, you know, a few meters to, um, you know, certainly many kilometers. And if we put our data into that, we can actually see um, where this all comes together. So the traditionally interpreted length of the Teton faults about 65 kilometers. That's just measured along the front of the range here, about 65 kilometers. Um, that should give you, based on the most uh, conservative scaling coefficient, I want to make this point, we're using all of the most conservative everythings in doing this, but the most conservative scaling coefficient gives us a fault length um, of about um, 3.9, or a fault displacement, I'm sorry, of about 3.9 kilometers, right? It's not even close. In the models I just showed you, none of them would even be close to this amount. It wouldn't even, wouldn't be close to the observations that we see. Um, but our base case model that we're sort of hinging on right now, and um, we're, we're doing more work to refine it, but we're looking at somewhere in the 11 to 14 kilometer range. This should give us a minimum Teton fault length of 190 to 230 kilometers using the most conservative um, scaling relationships. Now, when we say this, because people have always thought that the Teton fault is 65 kilometers long, it really gets people up in arms, people that care about the, the structure of this fault. And they'll say, well, that's just crazy. It can't be that long. Well, the closest contemporary fault to the Teton fault, in my opinion, is probably the Wasatch fault, the big range bounding fault um, that you see right next to Salt Lake City that bounds that whole range. Um, Todd Ehlers group did some work on that fault and found that the displacement's probably somewhere in the order of 12 to 13 kilometers. That fault is 300 kilometers long. So these numbers, they're not, you know, they're not all that, that absurd um, when you compare them to other things. So my third absurd conclusion is that the fault is quite long. Well, this is where stuff gets really interesting. Because if it's this long, then it's got to continue a good ways into Yellowstone, or at least originally had to before Yellowstone was here. So this is sort of what you could imagine this might have looked like. So this white ellipse here and, and faults are really these faults are really elliptical shaped right they've got their maximum displacement somewhere close to the middle um, it sort of tips out as you go to the edges and this is what they look like in 3d a lot of times 
although I maybe should have curved it with my detachment depth, but I have to work on my art. Um, but you can see this, uh, this pink guy here, this would be like a 95 kilometer fault extension north of, north of Mount Moran, right? So that's a 190 kilometer fault shown in the purple. Um, if we continue it the other way south as well. Um, and then the green is that, you know, the more extreme 115 kilometer fault extension. And you can see that just about reaches this other mountain range, which coincidentally, based on the work of my student, Rachel Four and some preliminary appetite helium dating seems to have the same age as the Teton range. And um, we're growing tired of circumstances in our lab. So what happens to the Teton fault then? Well, in earlier versions of this talk, I would show this picture of the caldera boundary. This is the, this is the Huckleberry Ridge caldera boundary shown here in purple. And these flows are the Huckleberry Ridge rhyolite flows that erupt out of the super caldera when it, when it erupts. And um, I haven't included the math on here, but essentially, if you took the Teton range, the volume of the Teton range, it would be like 1 50th of the amount of volume of material that's erupted out of this caldera. So in our early ideas, we just said, look, the thing collapses into the caldera. Well, we're not gonna, I'll, I'll tell you why we're not gonna punt that easy, but this is how we, we would say it when we were still working the problem. We'd say the Northern part of the range collapses into the caldera. And a lot of people would say, well, what about, you haven't done, can you do geophysics and see this? Wouldn't you see this mountain range sitting in there? But it, it turns out that a lot of geophysics depends on density. And the densities of a mountain range made of uh, granitic gneiss and rhyolites tend to have almost identical densities. So, you know, that's, that's probably dead. But I would throw this conclusion up here very speculatively and say, we think the range collapsed into the Huckleberry Ridge caldera. We don't think it's an accident that the Teton Fault and the Teton Range topography ends right at the edge of the caldera for Huckleberry, right? It's right there. Well, during the pandemic, um, the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory flew a new LIDAR data set that was released in late 20, early 2021 as a point cloud. And we were just talking in the hall with some folks about this. Um, and it's sort of funny because it's um, these point clouds when they have all the tree strikes and all the stuff in them, they're actually quite a pain to process. But the University of Kentucky has the Kentucky Geological Survey and they've done multiple statewide LIDAR flights. And so we actually coincidentally have this really incredible team of people who are really good at LIDAR. So they helped my students process all that LIDAR. And so we took off mapping. So this is the northernmost part of the Teton Range right here. These, these tufts that you see, this Huck, Huck Ridge Tuff, these are those tufts covering that northernmost part of the range. Um, the Teton Fault is basically right down here at the bottom and it's gonna start making its way up here. There's a lot of complexities in here. All this stuff you see is QLS, it's all hummocky here. These are some of the largest landslide deposits I've ever seen. Like these mega mountain scale landslide deposits um, and it's, we think it's one of the reasons why mapping faults through this zone is so difficult. But once we get out of those landslide zones and get onto these rhyolite flows, this is the Lewis Canyon flow, it's about 825,000 year old rhyolite flow on the pitchstone. This one's like 75,000 years old. We start seeing all these faults and a bunch of them, the bigger ones you can actually see. I wish I could blow this up even more, but you can see these, these incredible normal faults just ripping through this stuff. Actually, this slide are so incredible, you can see the glacial stria from the Yellowstone ice cap, which is really incredible. But you've got all these faults. And so I've got two projects going. I've got two students that are mapping all these fault-based LIDAR, all this LIDAR-based faulting. But I've also got a PhD student that's out here mapping um, all the larger structures and um, sort of ground truthing um, all of this fault map. So um, we're right here in this red box. I'm gonna, the next one I'm gonna show you is just north of here. But when we move north, a lot of that faulting disappears. Um, there's some of it up here in these dry creek and bluff point flows, some of it here in the pitchstone flows. And at first we were sort of flummoxed by this, but then it was really obvious. These are really young flows. Particularly this pitchstone flow has seen 75,000 years of this history, right? It's hardly anything. So we started realizing that potentially there's a normal fault zone here that keeps trying to grow. These rhyolite flows keep flowing over the top of it. And it's like repaving the road over a road that keeps offsetting, right? Every time you do it, the thing's starting over. And we said, okay, let's keep mapping and then we're gonna find some way to normalize this. So we kept moving north. Um, you can see the Mallard Lake Dome. This is a resurgent dome. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, all these black lines are mapped faults by the USGS. But these are our LIDAR based ones. Um, these are all down to the east or down to the west, um, east-west extensional normal faults. 
um, elephant back. You get a whole bunch of these guys. And I, I, I hope you can actually see some of these. I maybe should have included our slope map that we use for mapping some of these. Um, the Nespers Creek flow. Um, and then we get to the north. This is the northern, this is the Gallatin range. This is that East Gallatin normal fault. And you can see these modern ground ruptures beautifully linking up with that fault. Um, it's really spectacular, particularly because this place was, was bulldozed over by the Yellowstone ice cap. It's really spectacular that a lot of this stuff persists. If you put those all together in a map, you get this like really um, spectacular linkage. So here's the Teton range and uh, down here, this would be the Teton fault right about here. It's not shown on the map, but and all these red lines show those linkages. Remember, this is the really young flow that's, that's just recently covered everything up. Um, but you can see these, this, this zone, this persistent east-west extensional zone moving north. And so we started saying, okay, but how could this be a big normal fault? Well, I'd spent a bunch of time mapping in the Gulf of Mexico. And I remembered what these faults actually look like. When you go, when you see these things in seismic, this, these are huge normal faults. But when they're forming as sediment or rhyolite or whatever's being deposited over the top of them, they're never single persistent fault that's really clear. There are always a bunch of synthetic and antithetic faults that are accommodating part, that are partitioning parts of that strain and spreading it out over these, these larger areas. So in the surf, in the subsurface, I'm sorry, at the surface, this is what it looks like. It's a bunch of pieces of smaller faults accommodating the larger offset. This is probably one of the most famous normal fault photos in the world. Everybody that's ever been here to teach structural geology uses this outcrop. Um, this is actually the Moab fault system across the street from Arches National Park. Um, it's incredible. The layer cake stratigraphy offset all these faults. None of these faults are the Moab fault. All of these are little antithetic and synthetic faults that soul into the greater Moab fault system. So this is actually really common. Um, the other thing we have to think about, though, is how these faults actually grow and what the age of, of these units that are being faulted tells us about these systems. So if we take a simple fault ellipse, we would say, okay, in the middle of this fault, we're going to have the most displacement. It means we're going to have the highest displacement rates somewhere near the middle, and they're going to sort of go down as we move towards the edges. So we said, okay, let's go back to our LIDAR mapping. Let's add up the displacement that's being accommodated by these flow units. Let's take that displacement and normalize it for the age of those units. And if these faults are the same faults, we'll expect to see some pattern in that system. And so that's what we did. And so these are all the places where we've been doing these estimates. And so we've got, there is a range of things represented here, so it's not as simple um, as, as it could be, but we've got, um, the ones I really want to focus on are the stratigraphic. These are the mapped offsets, places where we can see an actual cutoff. Most of those are in the south where the displacement's a little lower. Um, we've got thermochronology transects. These are the displacement estimates I just showed you. I mean, but we did this for a whole range of these transects. Um, we've got these northern, these are the SCARP mapping. So these are the Yellowstone flows. And these green ones are actually some more recent um, offsets of those glacial SCARPs I showed you. We don't really. I put those here just for fun, but we don't really consider them in this because they're, they're covering a much shorter time scale. But it is interesting that they kind of show the same pattern. But what we see is from the southern tip of the fault, obviously really low displacement rate, but that rate picks up as we move towards the center of the fault. This is the Eagle's Rest transects, the way up here in the north. And you can see that these, these transects, um, except for the Gallatin fault, which is we're still working on, and, and, and it may be something more complicated, but these Transects really fit that pattern of displacement rate that we just talked about. So um, what our group is doing now is trying to find more constraints to sort of, I don't know, I guess the way I would put it in our group meeting this week, I said these displacement rates are making me uncomfortable because they're too easy, right? They come, they've come together too easy. It's too clean. Um, so we're, we're working on ways to make them more complicated so that reviewers don't look at them and you know, think horrible things about them. But it still leaves us this big challenge. Okay, so let's say that all those things are correct. All the things I just told you are correct, which is a huge assumption, right? Um, we still have to get rid of this range topography, but there's a lot of complexities that go into it. Um, these patterns right here show the outline of the thermocron contours. We get this big shift, this big change in the age of the thermochronology for a given elevation. Here in the north, it corresponds to this huge drop down in swath topography, about a half kilometer. 
we think there's a major structure here that's normal to the Teton Fault that's actually leading this part of the range to drop down. It's accommodating some of this collapse of the range um, when it starts to fall into the caldera. And we see the same thing here um, as we move further north, another big drop in average topography. This aligns perfectly with the edge of the Lewis Creek caldera, which we think is one of these drop-in boundaries. So we actually think that getting rid of this topography is not an impossible task. And you know, this has been proposed um, previously by Nadine McCory and uh, Dave Rogers, and they were looking at mountain ranges north of the range, but they were essentially using these Mesozoic fold hinges to show how the ranges sort of bend over into the plateau. And I think um, what these guys were onto is a, is a, is a similar, it's a post-eruptive mechanism, but it's a similar mechanism for removing this topography. And I've seen the dips on some of these things in the field. I mean, it is really spectacular. You can almost just see the range just rolling into the Snake River Plain. So whatever's doing this, we still have work to do, but it's probably a combination of what Nadine and Dave were seeing and a combination of the stuff that we're seeing with these discrete drops in topography. So I won't read you all the conclusions again, but this is kind of our really absurd story that we've put together. And we're still working on it. This is my student, PhD student, Ryan Goldsby. Um, he got an EDMAP grant to go up and map these northern area where all these structures are really complex. We've been working on that um, all summer. These are actually the Huckleberry Ridge rhyolites that he's standing on top of. They, they look like granites. They're really, really spectacular. But we have a lot of work to do. And so if anybody's interested in more details, um, then I'm happy to go through this with you tomorrow. Um, this is a picture we took descending into Jackson Hole a couple of years ago. And it was taken like at the last minute with an iPhone camera, which is why it's a little fuzzy, but it was really spectacular. But um, I've always loved it because you can really see the, the, this is looking north towards Yellowstone, north of Jackson Lake. And you can see this like collapse of the topography. It's just completely gone. But we're doing a lot more things and we're inspired to do this by um, the always anonymous reviewer number two. We've all had this reviewer. He lives in our universe um, or he or she, or whoever it is, anonymous or infinite, infamous reviewer number two that um, outrageous interpretations require incredible proof. And I, in some ways I believe that's true, but in some ways I think that we limit the way we think about ideas because we don't have the incredible proof immediately. But as I said, in my group, we're getting sick and tired of circumstances, things that keep aligning and, and sort of encourage you to keep pushing forward. So um, I would encourage you all in your work, you know, don't be totally absurd, but do the same. Allow yourself to be a little bit outrageous, even when reviewer number two is being a jerk. Um, so to address reviewer number two stuff, and these are some things I'll talk about tomorrow, if folks are interested. Um, we're taking our modeling to the next level, doing this in P-Cube, um, taking those electrical kinematic models you saw and actually turning them into thermal kinematic models that make predictions about the appetite helium and appetite fission track ages we expect to see under different scenarios. We're comparing those with the age elevation gradients for all of our transects and trying to really nail this in. And what I can tell you without boring you with details is that a lot of it is backing up on the stuff that I'm showing you today. But I, I still consider the biggest challenge that we're facing to be explaining with discrete structures and, and detail um, exactly how this range topography collapses. So this is looking across. Um, this is the high part of the, of the northern range. And you can almost like see, you can almost convince yourself, you can see this sort of drop down um, in these rhyolite and Paleozoic stratigraphic units. Is that drop down just because that's where the fault ends, or is it actually collapsing into this into this zone? Well, we've got um, an EDMAP proposal going, working hard. Ryan's working really hard to map those things out. We've got a bunch of geophysics shoots tracking those missing faults through some of the landslide debris, um, and we've got another EDMAP proposal planned um, moving south into Survey Peak in a couple you know, over the next couple of years. Um, and then the last thing that we're doing, um, I mentioned the seismic gap at the beginning. And this is, you know, another place where apparently I'm now working on lakes. I don't know anything about lakes. I didn't even know what a paleolimnogeologist was. Um, but my colleague, Mike McGlue, is an outstanding paleolimnogeologist. And we've gotten really lucky shooting seismic data on Jackson Lake and recovering what he says are some of the most incredible lake seismic reflection lines ever collected. And in those lake seismic reflection lines, we're mapping what we're calling potential seismites. These are horizons that have multiple mass transport or sort of underwater debris flow 
deposits that we think are related to seismic activity. And if we can date these things, then we're hoping that we can put more events in that seismic gap. We can fill that seismic gap for the Tetons. And so um, in September of 23, we'll be targeting a 40 to 60 meter core. We've got about 90 meters of sediment thickness. Um, if we collect this 60 meter core, it'll be one of the longest lake cores ever collected in North America. So there's a lot of other implications for things like climate, et cetera. And we, we think these cores might be quite old and um, really, really spectacular. So this is something else that we're chasing. Okay, so if you're gonna end your talk, you gotta end it with a picture of your, um, this is my research group. We were out on a seismic shoot. The thing we're standing on is one of those active fault scarps um, that we documented in the LIDAR and we decided to stand on it like a slain elephant and take a photo. So anyway, I'll take uh, any of your questions. If there are uh, any questions in the room, um, just wait for a microphone because we want people online to be able to hear you. And it looks like I have one from Steve. Um, are there identifiable xenoliths from Teton Range rocks? If, oh, oops, I'm sorry, are, hard to read this. <clears throat> are there any identified Xenoliths from the Teton range rocks in any of the Huckleberry Ridge flows? I, I, so I guess the, the short answer would be that I don't know. Um, we haven't looked for them. The, the problem is really that Huckleberry Ridge would be the, the Huckleberry Ridge would be the event that we think the, led to the caldera collapse, but then it's subsequently covered by, you know, 30 something flows. A lot of them are a lot younger. So they're sort of obscuring that whole record. One of the things that we're gonna try to do next year, um, assuming that all the permitting and stuff comes into place is to actually try to shoot. We've got a new ground penetrating radar unit, a, a hyper stacking unit that's, um, it, it's shown pretty good promise at shooting through these layered rhyolites and actually seeing a lot of structure. We did a bunch of test shots in Rockefeller this summer. So we're gonna try to shoot and see if we can image any of the structure of where we think the range collapses and starts to be covered by the rhyolites. We were going to try this with a seismic reflection instrument, but we need something that can do, that can, that's pretty powerful. And we have a mini vibe, a little vibra size that we could use, but. Needless to say, the Park Service isn't real thrilled with the idea of a trailer that thumps a 2,000 pound weight on the ground continuously for days. So we're sort of limited in some ways by, the, by these challenges. Um, but we're, no, the answer, the short answer though is no xenolist, but, but I agree that there, we should see some structural artifact of this and we just haven't been able to image it yet. We haven't been able to image anything yet. It says, thanks. Ramon, do you want? Thanks, Ryan. I enjoyed that. Um, one question I had was maybe I remember this paper from Parsons and Thompson quite some time ago that talked about accommodating extension in this region, either purely by faulting or purely by diking. And that was one of the explanations for kind of the, the low relief, but medium elevation of the Snake River Plain. So I wondered if you know, I don't know that much about Yellowstone, but are there dikes being intruded in Yellowstone at depth that might be accommodating some of that extension? And so that's why the faulting is more complicated under the active volcanic system. Well, well that's another tough one. Um, I, once again, I, I'm not sure. I mean, the I, I liked the model that Nadine and Dave Rogers had about um, the sort of the post-eruptive subsidence but it doesn't really explain what's going on in the Tetons, right? Because Yellowstone is still this dome, this big dome structure. And I, I you know, I don't, I, I don't really know. It's all like emerging so rapidly, particularly the stuff in Yellowstone and the new LIDAR data that, <clears throat> that we haven't spent enough time thinking about not only what we should be looking for, but how are we gonna go after it? So, I, I mean, once again, I hate to punt it, but yeah, I would say, I, I don't really know. I, I haven't seen a bunch of these dikes. I mean, we've. I, we've worked a bunch of these maps. If they're being intruded, they're being intruded at depth and none of them are making it to the surface because it's all, it's just these overlapping rye flows. 
but I had never realized how complex the rhyolite flows were until we started map doing the geology mapping on top of the uh, on top of the lidar, and it gave me this tremendous respect for Christensen and um, love these guys, these legendary mappers that did all this stuff with none of this data. So really incredible. I don't have any more online. Oh, there's some right here. Um, you can... um, the fault you had up in the north that maybe the Teton fault might link up with, are you planning on doing kind of a similar, like high detail thermochronology transects up there as well? So we, we tried to, it's, it's Paleozoic rocks. So one of them, the, the mountain that you see, oh, let me went the wrong way, sorry. The, um, the southernmost mountain there is actually, the top of it is called Trilobite Point. So the, right away, you can imagine what the prospects are for doing thermochronology at Trilobite Point. <laughs> um, the, there are some, so we have collected some of the basement rocks that are up here. Uh, we've, we've had some logistical challenges. Believe it or not, this is the most grizzly bear dense part of Yellowstone. And it's so grizzly bear dense in the summer that the park service doesn't allow anyone in there except with special permits. So we have to go with four people and do all this stuff. There's a lot of elk carcasses up there, which I still don't, I need to talk to my biology friends about this. But the answer is yes, we'd love to, but it, logistically it's just, it's not nearly as easy as the Tetons and the data is really limited. We do have two samples from there. Um, they're about 12 million years old. One of them's got a really high error on it because it's only two grains, but one of them's got five grains and it's got an error of like two million years. So I, I mean, whether or not they're the same fault, I, I don't know, but it's, it's clear that the eight this, of that fault is very close to the Teton one. Yeah, I, I hope we can get more data, but who knows? It's, it's, a, it's a tough place. We tried it and I think it was 18, we tried to do this and it just didn't work out that great. Hi, have you seen any interaction between the underlying Teton fault and some of the newer faulting from the resurgent domes in Yellowstone? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's definitely going to be interaction between, like when you go to, you know, to Mallard Lake, um, these are, it's hard for us in, in somewhere like Mallard Lake with this resurgent dome. It's actually hard for us to separate what we consider to be east-west extension from, you know, all this other stuff. And, and arguably, it's probably all like kinematically linked in some way. So um, I would put a huge question mark on any estimate we got out of Mallard Lake Dome because that resurgent dome faulting is, is really complicated. And it also, the, the challenge here is that all these um, normal faults all control because there's, you know, if you've been to Yellowstone, there's, even though it's uplifted and it's the continental divide, there's not a lot of local relief there. So whenever you get one of these fault breaks, it becomes the ditch that all the water drains out of. And so you have to also try to find a way to separate it from, you know, simple erosional and, you know, sort of valley incision. And it, it, it's actually really, really complicated. So the answer is yes. I mean, it's, 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 they're probably linked and it's hard to separate them in some cases. There are no questions online. Anybody else in the house? So thanks, Ryan. That was super interesting. Pretty cool place you're working there. I was um, struck on, I'd missed that uh, Nady Macquarie work, the folds and the kind of bending of those mountain ranges down into the, um, the plains there. At the end of the Tetons, you talked about a couple topographic steps down. Do you see, I mean, have you done the structural work? Are there faults going across there or yeah. you, are they bending down? What's happening? Um, okay, so yeah, I, I don't have the, the image in this talk, but at that first big one where you get that big change in, in helium age moving north and you get this big drop in topography, there's this really linear drainage called Snowshoe Canyon. It puts basement on basement. so. You know, people would say, oh, there's no fault in there. We've mapped in there or something. You know, there have been two people that have mapped in there and they didn't map a fault there, but I'm not sure how you would know. One, the, the fault's going to be in the bottom of the valley and two, it's basement on basement, you know, and that stuff all is tough. But what's interesting is that that is also the place where the Teton, the modern Teton fault actually jogs two kilometers to the 
to the east. If you go to the top of that drainage, the whole drainage divide also jogs two kilometers to the east. And it's also the place where the, where the drainage divide splits into two drainages. So there's like a really complex sort of geomorphic story that's evolving there. In our lake seismic data, if you keep following that structure over, it actually is the southern boundary of the deep depot center of the lake, which is about 150 meters deep there. So the short answer is we haven't definitively found this structure, but there are multiple lines of evidence that suggest that it exists. And this is part of our southern EDMAP extension project is to get in there and try to map it. Once again, it's, I mean, it's arguably some of the most, it, it's, it's not that far from the road, but because it's on the other side of Jackson Lake, it's arguably some of the most isolated country to work in. So logistically, it's gonna be very interesting. There's no trails or anything in there, but we're gonna try to get in there and map it. I mean, if it's there, we've gotta be able to map it. So we're gonna, we're gonna try. So we, we do think we've mapped one of these things in the North and that's the work that my student Ryan Gold has been doing up there. Right. So that jog in the fault you think it's just the the down drop and the dip on the fault or something is that add up that way i don't know it's very weird i mean the fault i wish i could show this picture but the fault it, it's in our paper our 2021 paper it's the last figure but the active fault comes you know ripping right up through moran bay and just hits this mountain hits the edge of eagles rest peak jogs over two kilometers and you, you actually can barely see the jog in it there's not a real clear jog in it and then it just picks up again and, it, and the displacements are the exact same across those modern features. And Eagle's Rest Peak has ages um, at, the, at the summit of Aptite Helium ages, really good ones of like 70 to 90 million years. Mount Moran, the next mountain to the south, has the top of Mount Moran, which is even higher, has ages of like 20 million years. So there's like this huge break in the ages. And that's exactly what you'd expect, right? If we drop down this older pediment um, that is now the top of Eagle's Rest, we would expect to see those older ages because it's not really been eroded the way the top of Mount Moran has. So, you know, I don't know. It's one of the, it's another one of those things that we're like, we're this close, but we, you know, we can't definitively, I'm not, I don't have a great photo of my student, you know, standing on the fault saying, here, we found it. So it's been tough. All right. Well, do we thank Ryan very much for an excellent lecture. Thank you.